was one letter that we had from um, one of my uh, great grandparents. Um, my um, grandmother came from Nelson, and uh, the farming, uh, or her brother, had been farming in many Tudu Road. And uh, in this letter, it made a comment about one of the daughters who had been sent up there to stay for a while. And the letter went something like, "May has returned to Nelson. I don't think we're going to have any more problems with her anymore." <laughs> And sort of having been dealing with some teenage grandchildren issues, I thought, yeah, nothing has changed in the world. <laughs> but um, communication, I mentioned before about Albert Bennett, the postmaster at Makatu, with um, uh, the Morse key. Uh, luckily, I was uh, a ham radio operator in my youth, and um, Dad said, uh, you should have this. And it just remark oh, it makes you think about the changes and how we communicate that um, the amount of information they could transmit over a period of time was very short, yet um, just before we, we came, our, our camera ran out of disk space and we had to transfer the data onto here, and I was just realising in five minutes, I guess, we would have transmitted the amount of information here about a hundred times. Mm -hmm. You know, so the scale of things has just changed so much. And, Part of what I see with this memory, or researching or uh, investigation to the memory, is that it actually gives you a foundation to understand where the future is. Because the future is what we make it. Mm. And what's the old saying? If you, if you don't learn from history, you'll repeat it. Mm. And it's so important to have that understanding and to pass that on. And, and part of what we've uh, been doing uh, here is taking the records of the school and the history of the school and digitising it so more and more people can see it because as you know with libraries and so on um, certain books you have to go with white gloves and, and, a, and, a, and a minder <laughs> so that you're not ripping out certain pages or, or just damaging them but in digital form it's almost like the real thing these days and now this is going to be shared uh, uh, with everyone um, so moving on to um, um, to my side, I'm going to speak just, just very briefly and then hand over to my father, uh, who gives a, a commentary on the mural that um, my mother was commissioned and uh, in the uh, entrance lane. Uh, the, just so people understand where the Venice came from, originally it actually came from Germany, but about 1709 they moved uh, out of uh, Europe uh, as part of what was known as the Palatine Migration uh, due to climate, politics and religion. The climate was so bad then that they used to keep animals in the bottom floor of the house to warm the house during winter. Well, those animals froze solid. <laughs> That's how bad that it was a mini ice age. Um, there was issues with the politics of the region and um, at that time, I think the, it was the bad French coming across to Germany and beating up the nice Germans. Of course, the central later yeah, went the other way. <laughs> anyway, they were not allowed to leave, so they actually used to travel at night down the Rhine. And they ended up in Holland and then transported to London, where they were known as the Poor Palatines. Uh, most of them went to America, but uh, a bunch of them went to Ireland, or were sent by Queen Anne there to further the Protestant cause, as it was known. Uh, Queen Anne gave them a gun each, it was known as a Queen Anne's Peace. So when you see those American movies where the cops say, I'm carrying my peace, that's where, that's where it came from. Anyway, um, five generations, they intermarried with other German families, except for the last generation, uh, whose children uh, immigrated to New Zealand and America. Um, we had two brothers. Uh, Albert, my great-great-grandfather, and John, who came about 20 years later. He'd been in the British Army as a paymaster in Gibraltar, had married the daughter of a, uh, another soldier who had married a local Spanish lady, so there's some Spanish blood in that line. Uh, Albert was uh, a telegraphist. Uh, many of you don't know that Ireland was the first country to go online. They connected the translator Morse cable or telegraphic cable from America. So Ireland was the first country to go online. 
uh, all at a very slow speed. <laughs> um, Albert uh, trained as a telegraphist, but by the time he did, all the jobs were taken, so he came out to New Zealand, became a postmaster, and um, was stationed in, originally in Auckland, liked Makatu, bought some land, but then got transferred to Waihi, um, Patia, Wangarei, when he retired, and then came back uh, here. During that time, he reported on the uh, eruption of Mount Tarawera, uh, which you mentioned before. Uh, and that has actually helped make this area so lush, because I think he, he recorded there was three inches of ash at Makatu. So, amazing amount. And I always wonder, because occasionally you see snow on Mount Tarawera, I wonder what it would look like if the mountain was still there, you know, with snow on it. It would have been rather beautiful. Um, so uh, he convinced, uh, Albert convinced his brother John to come out, although one of the sons, I think it was, it was Ted who came out, um, preceding his father, uh, and he was the first um, European to actually settle in, in Pongakau. But Pongakau settled out of Makatu, because Makatu being a port, that's how people got around. Uh, and the settlements came out of, of of the settlement of, sorry, the Pongakawa came out of the settlements of Makatu. Mm. Um, that's about as much as I want to go, because we talk all day and then you all get very hungry and bored. Um, and I really want to play this because this is sort of special, this is uh, obviously special to me, seeing my father and mother um, uh, efforts together. Um, and again, thank you to Andrea, it's so brilliant that you did this at this time. So, what we're going to try and do, we're going to play this. We don't have the fanciest of sound systems, so I'm going to put the microphone by the um, laptop and hopefully we'll get some audio. Just please tell them that it's very amateurish. Oh yes, well this is, <laughs> now what year was this? Um, I think it was about um, 87. 1987. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. 101th anniversary of Mount Tarawera. And her husband, Mr. Ben and is going to tell us about the history of Mr. Thank you, Andrea. Um, looking at that camp it reminds me of the thrill we had when I was about your age, school when Mr. Bell, our teacher, managed to get a gramophone for the school. I have a wonderful gramophone there, we're playing records. And it was a wonderful thing. Times have changed a little bit since then. Yes, they have. Well, uh, as you know, my, my friend is a bit of an artist, and uh, she was several years doing this mural. I put a frame around it, the biggest picture frame I've ever made in my life. And I'll work along the top, and then the middle, and then the bottom. And this mural is really much the same as the story I've written for the centennial. This is a story in pictures, mine is a story in words. So, here we start. That's the creamery along the, just the other side of the Poonini Creek. <coughs> um, on the little ledge, just you start to go up the hill. And uh, those are 10 gallon, 20 gallon milk cans of milk, milk by hand. A lot of this is what I've already told you this morning. Um, doesn't matter, matter. It was fairly hard work in those days. And that was the school as it was when it was moved from here to Cedric Blaymeyer's farm. Um, the original school we'll find somewhere else, I'm not sure. But that's us children having uh, galloping to school or messing around, having cockfights or something. Now this is a much later period. Now, a few weeks ago, I was in the book, he had Dave Kogu, one of um, top dressing parts for many years. There was Wally Bell, uh, Rod Dahlberg and Dave Coburn <coughs> were the three main pilots. Dave had been flying for 47 years, the first year in the Air Force flying uh, Corsairs and then jets, and the rest of the time as a top dressing pilot. He clocked up 30,000 hours and he'd only had two slight accidents in that period, so he must have had an exceptional judgment because, you know, out in the country, the Top dressing plane is absolutely overloaded compared with any other type of flying. And sometimes farmers will string a bit of wire across the gully for an electric fence or something. And uh, because trees are always there as a hazard. I'll just come slightly down. That, I presume, is me sewing many of the old fashioned way. <coughs> it ties up 
having that about it. Uh, we used to cut a super bag, they were big bags in those days, 12 for the ton, it's against 20 for the ton now. And you'd put that over your soles and have this big bag of manure and you'd walk along like the side of manure, you see, oh my God, on those big sidings. It was hard work. I say, in those days, everything was done the hard way. Sure. Now, these were very handy, as long as you were in a place where there was a bit of wind, because we'd just keep pumping away and pumping away. And that little fin you see there on a windmill, um, if it's, it's worked with a, like a governor on an engine, you know how an engine has a governor that will only go at a certain speed if you, um, it'll draw more power to bring it up that speed, but it won't go any faster. And if a big gale came along, the, um, the governor would turn this fin around in line with the windmill and turn its edge on the wind so it wouldn't go. And if the wind went down, it'd come and face the wind and speed up again so that it couldn't over rev and damage itself. This bunker car has never had a, um, a church, but uh, church service has been held here in the school, hall, and private houses since, or, since the first ones came about 1890, so 100 years ago. And this represented a little altar table and a prayer book and a cross and these little pews. So that represents the open air, or just represents the church service that we held here through the years. Um, that is just why the helicopter's here, except that um, quite a lot of spraying has been done with helicopter spraying, weed spraying, that type of thing. That is, of course, kiwi fruit, the beginning of the kiwi fruit farm, and that's a blast sprayer. Not a bad effort either, but it's just how they do it. Blast it out in all directions. This is a um, very good impression of the old coaches, as they used to be. That's what this road was named after. And in this uh, story I've written for the centennial, um, I've got some excellent photographs there too of the early coaches. My father remembers these, but I, I have never seen a coach. Not only this one that takes people for rides nowadays, really more or less a wagon made into a coach, but the original coaches I have never seen. Now, these are the round bales. You see quite a lot of them nowadays. And um, my wife and I, down the South Island in 1988 and 1990, touring in a camper van. And um, they seemed to be in a big way down there. There was just row on row of uh, these big bales. I notice around here now they're getting more and more popular. This, of course, is one of the latest uh, cow sheds with the uh, rotary, rotary yard with the big gate that pushes the cows in. That's the milk tanker coming along. That, of course, was how it was done in my father's day sitting on a stool, the old cow switching with a tail every little while. The poor things don't have tails nowadays, which I think is very cruel because the old cow is content as long as he's switching the flies away. I personally wouldn't have it on myself, but most people seem to think so. Right. That's the hay bale before the round bale came along. Um, just forget what year we first got hay bale. It was soon after the war. That's the old hay truck. There were several types of uh, Loaders, they don't appear to have a loader there, but one was in front and would pick the bales up and pull them over the top of the cab. The other one you just hitched on this side, and as soon as you got a load, you just unhitched it and drove it into the stack. You had another one there loaded up in the bales. But most of my working life, <coughs> you seem to put them up by hand. <coughs> There's quite a lot of deer farming nowadays, so the old stag is represented there. Really worked quite a long time with that, getting that expression just right. And it'd be a dirty look of a stack. This was one of the earliest cream lorries. And little children used to think it was great fun in those days to uh, put an empty, you see, a, a can with cream in, you'd leave the lid up so it could breathe. And the empty cans, you put the lids down, but they'd leave in amongst the full cans uh, an empty can with the lid up. You see, in the cream lorry driver, put it down, you go to pick it up, you go flat on his back into the truck. If you try picking up something empty when you think it's a full one, you, 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 you'll come a cropper all right. We used to think that was really funny watching from a little distance, but we never actually caught that. Now, that's maize. Uh, in the old days, maize was grown quite a lot, even out in most of the island, but a big lot was grown there, and Gisborne, Gisborne grew a tremendous lot of maize. They still do. But that's <coughs> taken a drawing, a take from our maize crib along there, which I think was one of the last ones in the district. But a lot of those cribs were. Ooh, 100 metres long, 200 metres long. The Tom Mill Dixon farm along here, remember when it had a crib there about 100 metres long. So you drive the uh, 
maze out, and uh, then it was shelved as you wanted. Nowadays, now, first of all, I must say, in those days, there was a picnic atmosphere in a maze paddock just the same as in the hay paddocks. You'd have a You'd have a four-inch nail in your hand, and you'd split the uh, covering of the cob, take the cob out, and make little heaps. Keep that every few yards right along the paddock. And uh, it kept a lot of people employed, and uh, like the haymaking, it went on for ages and ages. Now, a big machine comes along, and he just, with big fingers, he just takes the cobs out of the crop, it shells the maze, and shoots it over to a truck that's driving along his side. To give you an example, my brother each year grows 80 acres of maize, and these big machines come along, and in about 24 to 36 hours, the whole job is done. Um, in the old days, when I was farming, a big area like that would keep about 20 or 30 people going for weeks and weeks, possibly months. So you can see why there's a bit of unemployment now, because the jobs are not there anymore for that kind of thing. This, I'll do this one then, that one. That <coughs> is the scene out in the hay paddock, uh, with the old thermet, that was a sort of a little uh, a metal thing with a, a sleeve of water all around inside, and a fart went up the middle, it lived underneath, and the heat went up the middle, for boiling a cup of tea, actually. And um, when I was young, we used to have uh, bottled peaches and cream and nice mutton sandwiches and all that sort of stuff. It was quite a lovely picnic atmosphere, but of course that's gone since uh, the days of hay band, because it's, well, they just, Leave the stuff ready for the bale comes along, bales it up, <coughs> usually works half the night, <coughs> then you stack them up next day. Now that's how we used to build most of my life. Early on, we used to uh, just fork it into the stack, and then we'd either put a wagon, or it was like a truck pick, you see a wagon beside the stack, and there might be three men pitching from the bottom on the stack, and that's got how you pitched on this wagon, there'd be two men on the way, and they'd pitch the rest of the way, up to about as high as you could get. And uh, to make the wagon high, you'd actually build it up with hay too, the blokes on the ground couldn't reach any more. But then the other uh, stacks came along in about the uh, mid-1930s, I think it was. Now there's a cable here, uh, that goes a rope pulley there, and down inside this mast, Another pulley at the bottom and up the side where the horse is. So the horse would go forward, the, this grab, that's in this grab position like that. Uh, it would open up, grab the piece of hay, lock it shut, and the horse would pull and it would pull that up there, and the man would guide it with two ropes, one to guide it on the stack and the other one to trip and make that grab release the hay onto the stack. Um, this, of course, is uh, the sweep bringing the hay that was modeled on our old David Brown tractor. Um, this is the sweep it used to bring in, that's the Bisley sweep. There were two well known types of sweeps the Bisley, which had the hay between the horses, and the bring it to stack and then back off and around. And the other kind was the Boo McDonald sweep um, that had casting wheels at the back. and. Um, the driver, the fella didn't get off that tall, he stayed on, he just back out and turned around when the time came. This, um, talking to my children about this, some of them would say it was uh, Rex Longworth's uh, school bus, some would say it was Dolphy Billings' school bus, and some say it was Tui Lowe's school bus, depending on what age they were. But that's typical of the early ones.
Done that one? Done that one. We'll get to the bottom now, I think. This, of course, children represents a deer farming and citrus growing. Citrus growing started about when I planted my orchard, about 1970. And um, a lot of farmers getting a bit old thought, oh, plant a citrus orchard and I've got a bit of income from my old age and I won't have to work so hard. But unfortunately, so many thought it would be a good idea that the market collapsed and that it never became very, very payable at all. This, what we used to call the Kiwi Express, the KMR2 Express, um, and of course that's Pongkawa Station. None of these stations operate now. That's Calf Day, of course, you still have those sort of things. But the one year I had at high school, in 1932, I used to go in uh, for the first few months I didn't board in town, I used to go from here. I used to ride my horse down to the Manituta station, um, go in on the Kiwi Express Tuesdays and Thursdays, I think it was. Uh, and uh, I think it was a freight train I came home on. And on the other three days, Monday, Wednesday and Friday, I used to go in on the back of a cream lorry and come back on a freight train. Pretty hard to get an education in those days. This was the old Pongkawa Hall, which was pulled down a few years ago before this lovely hall was built. And um, they took it to bits and uh, auctioned off all the bits and pieces. Um, I bought quite a bit of it for a fruit sign. Uh, Ron Blamar's bought quite a bit for, uh, I'm not sure what he got for, a big area of floor. But everybody has something, a bit of framing timber or a bit of roofing iron or some kind of thing. This could be based on uh, Pack 6 and Spiggery along there. But unfortunately, he built it uh, just before the tanker delivery came along. People stopped separating their milk at home. And uh, the pigs sort of died out around here. This, children, is a old-time stove in the old days. Stove never went out. A great big pot and a great big kettle. And that was the bellows that you whoosh, 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 you know, to sort of get it going. That's an Ericsson telephone. I've got one at home. Um, one of the very early telephones. The ones before that used to have, uh, they were on a wall and they had a beak that you spoke into. So you'd stand there with a thing on your ear and shout into this beak. And you really had to shout because the wires used to go along through hedges and barbie hedges and fences and everything else and lost a lot of their power on the way. That, typically find here, um, it's your horse shooting because all the horses had to be shot. And I learned that quite, my dad had a little smithy shop with a uh, uh, forge and anvil and everything else. He used to make his own horseshoes for his draft horse to get a wagon, a couple of wagons, I think. And he taught me at a very early age how to make horseshoes and shield horses. And I shoot our horses for school and for hunting and various things later on in life until I got a little bit old for that. This is uh, what I mentioned to you earlier this morning. Um, the first rural delivery used to come just along the coast road here, and all these side roads, many to Bush Road and uh, Station Road, and all those people used to have their boxes there, and they used to have to come and get their mail. But uh, I was telling somebody the other day, it's rather funny, some of the kids were picking the mail up to take home, and a bit hungry, and you know, a nice fresh bread in the box, and they'd take it in the middle again, and there wasn't quite so much bread, but home was always left in the box. And the local dogs used to get to know when the days when the woods used to leave meat in those boxes. Several times I've seen a dog eating a packet of meat to put the ground. That's the old the symbol of the old separator. Um, the very first separator used to turn the handle, and later on well, they were driven by machinery. But uh, home separation started when this creamery packed up about 1916, I think. That's the year before I was born. So I grew up with, first of all, hand separating, and then uh, machine separating. The separators used to have a bell, and uh, they do a ding each time you came round. So you got up to the operating speed, and then the, there wasn't time for the thing to fall around and make a ding, we'd just make it click, click, click. So if you're turning and started ding, 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 you know you're going to slow up the pedal a bit faster. Uh, even the mechanical ones have that system on. That's is in memory of the uh, local boys who were killed in the First World War. They were just young men. They gave their lives to give us the freedom we enjoy today. That represents the old flax mill down there. It was going when I started school, and uh, just remember, I just forget when it packed up, but I think it 
packed up before 1930, when all the flax was used up. And uh, it was used in the 30s depression as a relief camp for fellows working draining the Uwaii swamp, all the swamp down here. And um, then later it was a pea factory for a few years, but it didn't get off the ground too well. Um, this is about a 1923 Model T Ford. They're very reliable, they had plenty of clearance because all you had was tracks, you know, and big high ground in between the wheels in those days. That was a very similar one to one that um, Mr. Joe Blamar, Cedric Blamar's father's father, old, old Bluey, I think it was William Blamar, had. And I can remember that on the model T, it was very like that one. I think I've been through, I've been through the lot. And just, just a couple, the lady in the, with the carriage, they small. Oh, yes. And we didn't really cover the kiwi fruit. Good. That is a, a gig, um, which is, is the gig. There was gigs or buggies. Buggies had four wheels and gigs had two wheels. And spring carts had two wheels. And drays were like spring carts, except they didn't have spring. They just were carting stuff. They had no springs at all at all. Um, to give you an idea of transport, how it was changed, children. My mother came up from Nelson in 19, um, 1908, and she lived 50 miles inland from Nelson, so she went by a coach to Nelson, across Cook Strait and the Strait of the Steamer, by a sort of little coastal boat up to Wanganui, then another one up to Onehunga, and by coach across Auckland from Manuka to Wakaman to Auckland Harbour, and by scow down to Taronga, uh, where her brother, Jack Phillips, came on here, met her in his spring cart and uh, brought her home. I think it took about 10 days or two weeks. Well, now you can go up to Rotary Airport uh, to breakfast and you can have your morning tea in Nelson. So I'm just changed this and thing. Now, the kiwi fruit, the kiwi fruit boom came how long ago, Andrea? Very soon after, so 10 or 15 years anyway, and uh, it came in with a bang. The price was good, um, the, uh, the land prices went up. At one stage, we were paying $15,000 per acre of land, that'd be about 30000 a hectare uh, for bare land, and you had to plant a key if you put all your um, staging in to hold it and wait about five years. And uh, kiwi food were getting about $10 a tray in those days, but gradually the price settled and settled, got down about six. And I'm afraid a lot of people who weren't too well in there with money um, lost everything they had. Some were perhaps a little bit ambitious. They would keep building very elaborate buildings or buying another orchard to save paying tax. And then when the recession came, they were just a bit caught short, and some did come quite a crop. But uh, now it's settled around about the six or seven dollars a tray. People who have managed to weather the storm uh, are managing to survive. And I'm sure it's earning a lot of export income and will have for quite a long years to come. But like everything else, there's a bit of a boom and then the price has to settle. Another thing that didn't help was that anything connected with kiwi fruit, uh, sprays, equipment and whatnot, I'm afraid a lot of us scrupulous people really stuck the price on. And um, if it was for something for a citrus orchard, say a spray, it might cost $5. If it was suitable for kiwi fruit, they charge you $10. So that didn't help at all. Anyway, have I been around the lot now? Um, Rene took about two years, the same time to do this, it took me to write the book about that thing. And uh, she loved it, she loved painting, and she was very happy to do it for the district. Um, it'll be as the years go by, it must be appreciated more and more because most of you children have never seen these things live. You've never seen many pigs around. You haven't seen a real puff puff that goes puff puff. That's a case that people thing. It's not nearly so romantic. And uh, stack is, of course, a uh, thing of the past. So, they all were. They will be. A lot of them are like me, a bit of a has been. Thank you very much for listening. Anybody? Want any questions about it? You want to have a thought then? No. Um, Libby, um, Libby is 
Mr. Ben and Ben's great niece. And Libby, I'd like you to thank Mr. Ben on behalf of everybody. Please, would you like to go to the front? On behalf of class, I'm Libby and Mr. Thank you very much, Vicky. Yes, Vicky is my, um, my younger brother's daughter's daughter. So she's my niece's daughter. Oh, right. What, think of. what do we call cousins? No. Cousins. Yes, right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, children, for listening. Twelve, okay. Just um, perhaps a couple of questions. Have anyone's got a question they'd like to ask anyone? Paul. I've got quite a nice story about that video. We had a, a preview of it just before Christmas at uh, Andrew and Kevin's house, and uh, we've got a place in Mount Wanganui, and I walked down to the beach just before Christmas for a surf, and this old guy, I'll old, be old, 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 sitting there with a dog <laughs> and white hair, and I said to him, how long have you been in Mount? He said, oh, about 45, 50 years. And I said, what's your name? And he said, my name's Dave Kohu. Oh. And he was the, the pilot. The pilot. Oh. And so he told me about, and I said about it, I sent this one day video about him, and he told me of memories of burning and flying and coming here, and I think he might have mentioned the McCarthy's or farmers, he flew over. Mm. And I've never met him before. I've seen him twice since with a little dog in the beach. So it's sort of a great coincidence. <laughs> so he's alive, but not he walked along. Like, like this. <laughs> <laughs> there was another. There was another bit to add to that is that uh, Dad was a Spitfire pilot during the war but never got to fly much when he came back. And whenever the top pressing pilots used to come, he used to tell them, and they'd be go, oh, you know, an orc, Spitfire pilots, you know, in their day with a top gun. And uh, they had a little seat when the, the pilots would fly back at the end of the day to take the driver of the truck that used to fill them. So the truck didn't have to drive back. And, and Dad would always, in his inimitable way, of, talking people around, used to get a ride in the top dressing plane to fly around, sitting in the little seat in the back. <laughs> so he got his little fix of, uh, of flying that way. So, any other questions? Or, or questions or, or just comments to add to any of the story? Last night, there was a red aeroplane flying around. Yeah. Yeah. What was that? What was that? Because he flew around two or three times. It was Tim. Yeah. 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 I think it was an Austin. Does, it, does anyone know what place? It's John's old place. It's John's old place. And it's his son, isn't it? Yeah. It's his son. Yeah. John's old place. John's old place. Yeah. Yeah. Was it 1940? Oh. Oh, sorry. Um... Was it 1948 when the top pressing pilots first came? I can't say. Did they do that at 19? I think. Yeah. After the war. 48. Oh, well, that's because it went that top pressing. Was it the first one I saw? Well, it would have been after the war, I think, when uh, I think the, there were a lot of innovators, you know, people who'd been in aviation during the war. Um, applied to the, uh, their creativity. Uh, just as another little story, um, uh, my dad and his brother Rex Benner um, sort of were quite ingenious and they came across some research. They patented a device called the Benner Blower. And what this was, it was in the 30s, it was a device you put on the trailer of your, um, behind your tractor. It had a hopper and a fan and a big pipe out the back. And you'd put uh, fertilizer in the hopper, connect the fan to the power takeoff, and you drive around the paddock in a snake light, and this big pipe would blow the fertilizer all over the land. Yeah, so it was they were. It was ideal for the hills. Mm. And uh, then they got supplanted by the trucks that um, you know were purpose built, and of course um, aerial truck dressing for. Jack Dunn. Jack Dunn. Jack yep. Yes, no, I was um, talking to his. Some who was here before about that. John, yeah. Do you have any other stories? Can you send it to us? Can you Yes, in Vernon Banner's writings, which is in this book of the Centennial, 
There's a picture of aerial top facing on the court property. With Tidemark, the court family were the first, I believe, to use aerial top facing in Pomacara. It's in the book. Yeah. <laughs> Which will be indexed when I find yes, such a question. Can you get more yeah. 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 Okay. post office around this area? Oh. Post office. Yes, you can. Actually, can I, I can answer that. Oh. Um, Mr. Wilson? Yeah. Would like to know if you can find more information about the post office. Is that what you say? Um, yes, there was a gentleman who since died called Robin Starter, who was a member of the New Zealand Post Office Historical Society. He's written a heap of books about post offices all around New Zealand. When they started, um, when they finished, who the post mistress, postmaster, and if he could, he got a copy of uh, Frank. No, just that I remember an outlet, Bush Road, the corner of Bush Road on the old Coast Road. The post office was in our house That's right. at one stage. Yeah, it's in and, Cedric's and book. Then, uh, then it was uh, transferred down to the corner, and the old library was out, just out here, which we transported back home. So you've still got the post office? No. Oh. It's all destroyed now. We'd like a. I'm trying to find a little wee historical building for Tapuki to put um, behind the Constable's Gallery. The council have actually left some land there for me if I can find one. Uh, we thought we were going to get <coughs> the Ross's Garden Centre by the butcher, um, but unfortunately, when Mr. Kavanagh, when they went in to try and demolish it, the, it, the borer just went, oh, sorry, and when it just all fell to bits. We did take some photos so that we could get it rebuilt in Tamar's timber. I do have a house, probably the oldest house in the area. It's up Manaweka, no, sorry. What's the road off, up by um, of Pongakawa, um, Pongawa Strait? Manaweka, Manarangi. Man yeah, Manarangi Road. There's a two-story house up there. Yeah, um, um, Mr. Donald lives on it now. 397, I am Green Road. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> I know who you are, I know all about you. Um, <laughs> no, before that, the early day, there was a guy, Mr. Smith, had it. But he built, that was the third identical house. He built one at um, Makatu behind the Makatu trading, you know, where there used to be the petrol station. And that was the first house. Then he built exactly the same house about where Long Ridge is now, and that's where the uh, Pine Raw School was held before they built a school. And then he built the third house up Mangarini Road, and it's exactly the same house. So I'm trying to talk your ex-husband <laughs> into donating it. <laughs> But I think his idea is like, I'll donate it as long as you give me, you know, 200,000 or something. But, um, Apparently, this, as it goes, not telling tells the story, he's supposed to be building a new house. So, yeah. But all I know that when I left 18 years ago, the borer was still holding hands. Yes, yes. <laughs> so that's the third identical house built by Thomas Henry Smith, who had a daughter with a tohungares. And um, the daughter... Uh, yes, long story. Um, so Mr. Smith also built the, right, the bridges, and we think that might be one of his bridges. It's just on the right by the squash club. Because he certainly built the early bridges around. Uh, he was a bit of a character. Um, he used to, he obviously didn't get on very well for neighbours, so he used to take, get his daughter to take the stock over to the pound in Tauranga, and then the neighbour would come over and say, Oh, have you seen my... And he'd go, No. <laughs> and then um, the daughter, he'd see the daughter and he'd say, have you seen my... And she'd go, oh yeah, just took it over to Tauranga. So he'd have to go all the way up to Tauranga and pay a pound to get it out of the pound and then bring it all the way back again. Uh, that's a good way to keep up with your neighbours. <laughs> um, but the other oldest house in Tapuki, the very, very old, oldest house here, is actually dated. Um, when the people remove some of the timber, it's got... Um, Eddie Raymond's uncle has written the bill on the, on the timber. 
Unfortunately, the house was modernised in the 70s, 1970s, and it's now completely wrecked. It just doesn't, it has like stained glass, oh, not stained glass windows, you know those brown circle glass windows all over it, and oh. So there's nothing left of the original house, which is a real shame. Where's that? Number three road. Oh, yeah. So. But we'd like a little something small that we can turn into a museum. Not a museum, a glass museum. So the word is out. Yes. Do you know what I mean by a glass museum? Yes. Uh, I know. Uh, it has a glass along my wall. Mm. It's glass or perspex. So you can look in, but you can't go in because you don't want people to um, touch. touch. If you be, if you go to Wonga Momina, mm -hmm. he's been to Wonga Momina. No, yeah. Yes. Um, when you walk on the, one of the main streets, uh, one of the main streets, what, in, in Wongamamana, what they've done to one of the original shops is taken the back off it, so the whole thing's only about six foot wide, and um, it's concrete block around the side, so it's fireproof, mm -hmm. and it's set up like one of the original shops, and you don't actually realise it's not a shop until you look in the window and realise that it's a museum. That's the sort of thing we'd like to do, because we don't want to have to have a staff at all. Yeah. You know, anything like that. Yeah, if you've got the book, the book of the centennial of Pongakawa, you'll find on page, what is it, 148, about the Pongakawa Post Office. Did a bit of research to figure out who was the postmistress standing in the doorway that had turned out to be Miss Eileen Rockwell, later <laughs> my mother. <laughs> we never found the name of the dog which is in the picture. And below it is a Pongakara post office um, postman, a stamp. Yeah. One of those few things that has survived about the post office. Anyone else? Do we have any takers? Yes? Yep. Um, for those of you who haven't heard already, and some of you will have, have heard through the weekend, but in the foyer of the Action Centre, in a glass cabinet on the back wall, you can see the original minute book, cash book, and enrolment books of the school, and they've all been restored and digitised you can't take them out because they're very fragile because they're so old, starting in 1892. So go and have a look while you're there and have, because they're very precious. But they have um, been all treasures. digitised. They've all been digitised. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, and we. Uh,